Oh, hey, sup, it's Wan Show. Gonna get some bitches, get some pussy. Sup, Silent Luke. In all seriousness, though, we've got a lot of great topics for you guys, and it's gonna be a bit of an unusual show. YouTube's updated swearing and violence policies have caused mass demonetization of gaming YouTubers' videos. Wizards of the Coast has backpedaled on OGL changes after community backlash. Pezo moves ahead without them. Uh, ooh, there's been some interesting developments around the 7900 XTX and the problems it's been facing, courtesy of our friend Roman Der Bauer. And Luke had oral surgery, so he can't really talk. Hence the get-ups. Let's go ahead and roll that intro. <laughs> Oh no, I'm the one who does that. <laughs> Shit, man. The show's brought to you by Notion, FreshBooks, Squarespace. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> All right. So, why don't we jump right into our main topic for the day. Prominent gaming creators have stoked community backlash against YouTube over recent changes to its ad-friendly content guidelines, uh, which has caused many of said creators' videos to be age-restricted and or demonetized. Hence the title of the video and, uh, I mean, I guess live benchmark of YouTube's content filtering because I went out of my way to attempt to break their new filters or rather break the rules uh, within the first eight seconds of the video. Uh, the live stream went, in went live almost instantly on YouTube, which I'm not used to. Normally there's about a five to 15 second delay. I might have missed the window, but I, I, I took my best shot at it. Now, starting in October of 2020, the guideline stated that Frequent use of strong profanity could result in limited or no ads. But in April 2021, the guidelines changed to allow creators to use moderate profanity like shit and bitch within the first 30 seconds of a video. In November 2022... YouTube issued a, issued a major update, though, to these guidelines. Not only could profanity be used within the first seven seconds, uh, oh, not only could profanity used within the first seven seconds lead to limited ads, but all profanity was now treated equally, except for hell and damn, which apparently are no longer being treated as profanity anymore. What the hell? Like, damn! <laughs> damn's not even a swear word anymore. We're all going to hell. Uh, profanity used after the first eight seconds, though, was apparently fine as long as it was not excessive. The update also specifies that standard gameplay where gory injuries are present within the first eight seconds would lead to limited ads. On December 25th, Daniel Condren of RT Game asked YouTube for help after one of his videos was set to limited ads and... In addition to denying his appeal, YouTube subsequently flagged over a dozen more of his past videos. Condren believes that they were flagged because he escalated the issue. Hmm. Uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> Looks like Riley and I are kind of of the same mind here. Riley says, yeah, it does look like that. But as all-powerful as the algorithm is, it is actually not scanning every YouTube video all the time. So when attention is brought to offending content, it humans are more likely bots, uh, probably checks related content. ProZD has apparently tested the policy already, waiting 18 seconds before swearing, and the video still got demonetized. Hey, um, uh, Dan, can we just throw up our sponsors down here to just, just thank them for being part of making sure that we can run this demonetization experiment? Do you want to just throw, throw them up on the, on the bottom for me? Just one after the other. Hey, look at that. We got Notion today. We got FreshBooks. We got Squarespace. Those are some damn good sponsors. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, this morning, YouTube gave a statement to The Verge. And we've actually got the statement up here, which I have not had the pleasure of reading yet because I was busy getting dressed up for the show. In recent weeks, we've heard from many creators regarding this update. 
YouTube spokesperson Michael Asiman. Oh, so he's an Asiman. <laughs> so I thought maybe more of a more of a boobman, but <laughs> an Asiman. Okay, good. Uh, told The Verge. That feedback is important to us, and we are in the process of making some adjustments to this policy to address their concerns. We will follow up shortly with our creator community as soon as we have more to share. Well, that's not really a statement, is it? No, it's not. He agrees. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a few discussion questions here. First of all, what responsibility does YouTube have to inform creators of changes to its guidelines, both current or at come upcoming? I think, honestly speaking, that's the biggest problem here from my point of view. It's not that the rules exist, right? Like, it's been pretty common sense for us for a long time that you got to understand, ad safe guidelines don't come from YouTube. They come from advertiser tolerance towards a particular thing. So we all have our own internal, you know, moral and taboo compasses, right? Like for some people, uh, full frontal nudity is like whatever. Like my understanding as a North American, where that's like, is that in Europe, you can like have a billboard on the side of the f fucking road, okay? <laughs> Uh, okay, look, we're benchmarking the thing, okay? <laughs> you can have a billboard on the road with, like, full frontal nudity on it, and it's like, yeah, what? You know, like Holland or whatever. Over here? I mean, you show a little bit of crack, and that's, like, like not the kind you smoke, like the kind out the back of your butt or the front of your chest, right? Like, you're... Di Whoa, so edgy, right? I mean, that was more true 20 years ago, but... Even even today, compared to compared to other regions of the world, it's it's different, right? So everyone has kind of like their own their own ideas, whether it's nudity or violence or profanity for for what can be considered tolerable. By the way, for those of you who watching who do not like a profanity riddled WAN show, we'll be back to normal next week. Uh, feel free to let your kids tune in. We will not have the video marked. We are trying to get demonetized. That's how you'll be able to know the difference. Uh, Riley apparently is uh, adding notes in real time here. Note, excessive or excessive profanity can. Uh, okay, this is, this is he's taking. <laughs> he's not a good at typing board keyboard guy. Um, excessive profanity can lead to demonetization, so don't overdo it. I think is what he's is what he's trying to say. Anyway, my issue is not that YouTube has rules. Rules exist for a reason, and it's because brands simply don't like their brand next to content that they feel could reflect poorly on them. Whether that is, whether that's rational, like whether that has any, any, any data backing to it or not, sometimes people make emotional purchases, be it a gorgeous tech-themed water bottle, or be it a marketing campaign, okay? And... If they see something that they don't like, they could experience buyer's remorse and not work with that platform again. So I get it. The issue from my point of view, and I think Luke agrees, is that this is just happening. It's just, it's just happening in the night, and people aren't being informed. And clearly, it wasn't common sense to some of the people who use a lot of profanity and expect advertisements to show up on their videos just fine. And not only was it, you know, not common sense or whatever, but the community has ultimately figured out where the line was. People were figuring out how to stay within it. And then the line moved. That is not okay. I mean, yeah, I think this is Luke's cursor now because it typed a lot faster. Um, you know, Luke says it's kind of... Luke figures, you know, it's like when Elon randomly started banning everyone that was doxing people on Twitter when what really happened was he changed the definition of doxing. So if YouTube is banning people, or not banning, but demonetizing people for uh, using too much profanity, when even just the words too much or excessive are fucking meaningless, right? How how are how are people supposed to deal with that? And you gotta you gotta understand, right? YouTube is not some rinky dink little platform that you know people upload to for fun anymore. This is people's livelihoods that are at stake. Unless they have really great sponsors like, uh, 
Can you can you get those sponsors across the bottom for me again? Just wanna <laughs> just wanna shout out our sponsors who hopefully hey thanks Notion um, are comfortable being next to this kind of thanks Fresh Books um, you know, unsavory unsavory you know language right. Uh, Squarespace, Squarespace too. Shout out Squarespace. If uh, if they haven't ditched me yet, they're not going to ditch me now. <laughs> now, our second discussion question here is: What responsibility do creators have to be aware of potential changes like this and play it safe? Cough, cough. LMG. And that's true. I mean, you know, Luke has not been in favor at times of our family-friendly approach to. I mean, really, a lot of things. Like, we get edgy sometimes. Uh, I think that the how to hide your pornography video was among the edgiest things that we've ever done. Um, But we mostly get edgy in, like, kind of a a silly toilet humor, innuendo kind of way. We don't go straight for, you know, really, really vulgar language or, you know, really graphic uh, really graphic language or or imagery, um, and a big part of that has been out of staying advertiser friendly. It was a business decision. It was not because I have any particular aversion to using cuss words. Um, as for what responsibility creators have, like that's tough, right? Because creators are supposed to be diverse, right? That's one of the benefits of the platform. And there's a certain, I I don't think that for our type of content and for our message, there's any particular need to swear. And personally, I consider a a bleeped fuck to be funnier than a not bleeped fuck. I think that, I I just, I find it to be comedically um, superior, okay? So that's a, a huge part of the reason that we do things the way that we do. But also because we want to remain advertiser friendly. However, I think that there are creators whose personalities or whose message could be aided by speaking in a way that is true to themselves, and that might involve some cussing. And so for me to say, or for me to pass some kind of judgment, right, on the responsibility that creators have to be aware of potential changes and play it safe, I think it's it's one of those things where my my opinion's irrelevant, and so is his, right? Like we're we're coming at this from a space from a personality that doesn't need to communicate in that way, whereas some people do. And I I just I want YouTube to be a place where all kinds of creation can thrive. That is, as long as you're not spreading disinformation, spreading hate, you know, engaging in in illegal activities. If you're recruiting for ISIS or some shit, then as far as I'm concerned, you can get the fuck off the platform, right? But man, a couple a couple f bombs. I don't know. It's tough. I think that I think that if advertisers haven't already gotten used to the fact that YouTube is like kind of a zoo. There's a little bit of everything, you know, sometimes uh, it's the kind of zoo where, you know, they had more than two of that kind of animal. You know what I'm saying? You know, they got, they got a lot going on. It's a cluster. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, our, our next discussion question that Luke and I will be discussing is uh, what would need to happen to enable a, a YouTube level platform that doesn't rely on potentially prudish advertisers for revenue? Haha, <laughs> wait, that's float plane. Except it isn't, right? Because we know, we know it's not a sustainable model, right? Like once you've got a certain amount of momentum, like LMG, which I shouldn't call it that, Linus Media Group has over 30,000 paying subscribers on Floatplane that are anywhere between, we have like OG grandfathered in members at a $3, three US dollar a month tier. Uh, That is no longer available, hasn't been for years. In fact, I think the percentage of $3 tier users is really dwindling these days. Um, We have a $5 tier and then we have a $10 tier that gets you 4K, which is higher bit rate than YouTube's 4K. And most importantly, not necessarily image quality, but our audio is uncompressed, which is one of the big reasons that someone like Dank Pods is on Floatplane for his garbage time streams. with, it's super cool because he he drums, right? And YouTube's audio compression, Twitch for that matter, makes it so that like 
it, it doesn't have the dynamism that float plane streaming can get him, right? And so it's great for people like us who have that kind of critical mass that, I mean, you guys do the math, right? 30,000 people paying anywhere from realistically five to $10 a month is not an insignificant amount of revenue. It justifies a development team. It justifies us investing in a, a group of people that makes exclusive content just for that platform, right? Or for someone like for someone like Dank Pods, right? Where he's got a specific use case for it and a dedicated audience that is really into that kind of content that will pay for it monthly. But I've had a lot of people point out like, hey Linus, I couldn't help noticing I have to pay for every creator. That adds up too fast. I can't afford it. I get it. 100%. You are right. A platform like Vessel, where you can pay one time and get all you can get access to every creator on the platform, that's way better. But you aren't YouTube, right? So let's say you have 100,000 users or something like that, okay? Even a pretty good number of users. You got 100,000 users, okay? They're paying $5 a month. That's $500,000 a month. That's a ton of money. For an all-you-can-eat platform, okay, wait a second, hold on. How many creators do I have on here? If I've even got 50 creators, right? All of a sudden, now we're talking... 500,000. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, divided by five. Okay, that's twenty grand a month. That's a, that's a ton of money, um, man. Yeah, how can we get uh, how can we get a hundred thousand subscribers on Floatplane, man? That'd be, okay, anyway, the point is, you would have more than fifty creators if if we if we built a platform that was like an all you can eat, that was like a, a smorgasbord model. What would happen is the share for those individual creators. If we had fifty that were the size of LTT, for example, the share of that revenue for each of those creators that's left by the time you deal with payment processing fees, which are significant. Uh, man, we haven't talked about the exact numbers in a long time, so you're going to have to just kind of let me know. Uh, if I recall correctly, it was fifteen percent flat per transaction plus a percentage, give or take. Is it twenty-five flat? I don't know. The point is. It is a significant amount of money when you're looking at a $5 transaction. The lower the transaction, the bigger the proportion it is because you have to deal with that flat fee no matter what. So essentially, you're just enriching credit card companies, which the world definitely needs more of, obviously. Um, so as soon as you start to divide it between more and more and more and more and more creators, they lose their incentive to actually even bother to upload on the platform because you know what, I'm going to get my like 60, I'm MKBHD, right? What, I'm going to get my $60 check in the mail or even my $600 check in the mail. You know, I don't want to, you know, I, obviously I don't know exactly what his numbers are, but I work in the same vertical. I have some idea. I can tell you that a $600 check to Marquez is pretty much a rounding error, right? And with his costs, you, you guys got to understand, I'm not saying that because he's like so out of touch and just has so much money. I'm just saying that he's running a business over there. He's got a dozen plus employees, nice space, good equipment. He's trying to do a great job of what he's doing. Okay, it costs money to do that. And that amount of money ain't going to make a huge difference. So... Oh, okay. Hey, AJ is uh, posted in the Floatplane chat. I was apparently way off. It is actually $0.30 cents per transaction plus a percentage. So on those $3 transactions in the early days, we were giving up 10% right off the bat to a flat transaction fee. Now, I haven't been looking at the chat lately, but I'm sure some people are asking about Nebula. Nebula has a very, very different model where essentially they have a partnership with CuriosityStream that makes it so that you are basically getting Nebula for free if you sign up for CuriosityStream, who sponsors a lot of Nebula creators, effectively paying creators to promote getting their Nebula subscription for free. So it's like, is anybody actually paying for Nebula? Probably. But are more people likely paying for CuriosityStream and getting Nebula for free? Probably. Um, so it's a really interesting model over there. And then the creators on Nebula are stakeholders in Nebula. 
And my understanding is that that is dependent on like the size of the creator and overall contribution to the momentum of the platform. Um, and so what that means is that even if your check from Nebula is $4 a month or whatever, because whatever, depends how many people are watching, I guess, they don't have any external viewership stats or anything like that, which usually means that it's not heavily used. Um, so it doesn't matter, though, if you get a $60 check, because essentially you're getting paid to promote it by one of the, the associated media companies, and then you are maybe... Uh, in the event of, of of an exit, in the event that Nebula gets sold, you are getting some some cut of that of that sales check. So it's a very very different model. It's maybe someday something will happen, and also there's this very convenient synergy here with Curiosity Stream that I'm sure makes sense for Curiosity Stream on some level. Um, very very different dynamic from what Floatplane is, which is the money from the subscribers you can drive today, right now, and is sustainable. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need any external backing, nothing like that. We are, we are, we are profitable now. It's, it's amazing how many people I still see talking about the epic failure that was Floatplane. Guys, the numbers are right on the site. <laughs> They're right on the site. Floatplane is doing, through LTT alone, at least, what is it, calculator, okay? So five times 30,000, okay, here we go. Five times 30,000 times 12. Floatplane is doing at least $1.8 million US a year in revenue, and that's just on LTT. We don't have a ton of creators on the platform. I admit, the model doesn't make a ton of sense for everyone, but what it is, is it is sustainable. And Luke and I, I think, have been proven, maybe not right, but not wrong, multiple times since Floatplane's inception. I mean, look at all the controversy there was around Patreon and Vimeo, when Patreon was effectively having people just put up unlisted videos on YouTube for the longest time. And then there was the integration with Vimeo, where Patreon creators were able to use Vimeo to host their videos, and then all of a sudden, uh, Vimeo kind of went, uh... Hmm. Bandwidth and storage are expensive. If you guys don't start paying for pro tier Vimeo hosting, uh, all your videos are going to go away. See you later. And then now I think Patreon is self-hosting video, but I haven't actually looked at the quality of the service since then, so I can't really speak to if it's, if it's any good or anything like that. Um... Yeah, level one text has another eight hundred followers. I, I know, I know, uh, garbage time streams at like hundreds. I know that um, forgotten weapons has hundreds, if not. Uh, oh, uh, forgotten weapons does not disclose how many subscribers are on float plane. Forgotten weapons, uh, good guy and uh, good channel, doing good. <laughs> Why don't I just say that? The good news is I actually didn't know if that number was accurate, so uh, <laughs> you can assume it was wrong. <laughs> Neat. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to our next topic. <laughs> Wizards of the Coast has backpedaled on OGL changes after community backlash. Sort of. Um, we've got a big update for you guys, but first, for those of you who didn't tune into the show last week, let's give you a little bit, uh, let's get you up to speed a little bit. Wizards of the Coast, uh, owned by Hasbro, runs Dungeons and Dragons, um, basically had a license agreement in place with whether it was third-party content creators or whether it was, um, like community-run companies or even actually companies with significant revenues based on their Dungeons and Dragons IP. They had a license in place that pretty much allowed you to create derivative works uh, without paying any kind of royalties and without worrying about any sort of legal action. The license was perpetual and it is a huge part of why the D&D &D community has grown so vibrantly over the last couple of decades. I mean, we're talking everything from third-party add-ons to, um, I mean, you know what? A perfect example of someone that could be affected by this is that local creator Filthy Lot where they're doing those D&D uh, &D live reenactments where they, where they play the game and they do these like super high production value reenactments of their tabletop games. Uh, I could see someone like that 
even if they ultimately aren't affected and they don't need to pay 25% of their revenues to Wizards of the Coast, I could see them being worried about the legal ramifications of the new uh, general license. Um, and that's one of the things that changed. All of a sudden, almost overnight, with almost no warning, any companies that were profiting off of Dungeons & Dragons um, were going to have their license agreement changed. Uh, so this included a 25% revenue garnish. Um, that the fact, I think you had to submit basically anything to do with Dungeons & Dragons to them for, if not approval, at least uh, for them to, to look at and be aware of. Um, there were a handful of other particularly awful things, and it was basically going to happen like in a couple of weeks. Now, the thing leaked... And the community got understandably outraged because this is Wizards of the Coast basically coming in and going, hmm, you know what? The D&D &D community, the players, are woefully under-monetized. <laughs> and that's not even me just like trying to sound like an evil executive. The CEO of Wizards of the Coast actually said that, which is terrible. Described the player base as under monetized and it's like even if you're right okay even if your mba ass knows what you're talking about come on man come on you can't that's like it's like oh man how do i how do i it's just it's just disrespectful like, it's like if I it's like if I referred to you guys as as walking wallets instead of our community, right? Even if I saw you that way, even if I fucking did, right? You walking wallet pieces of shit. Even if I felt that way, you don't say the quiet part out loud. It's not tactful. It's disrespectful. So anyway. Let's get you guys up to speed. D&D Beyond staff, oh, oh, okay, have released a statement about the recent OGL changes. They have three goals in mind. Oh, they had three goals in mind. Okay. To prevent the use of D&D content from being included in hateful and discriminatory products. Okay. To address those attempting to use D&D in Web3 slash blockchain slash NFT material. Oh, I'm already calling bullshit on this because the document. Okay, so the original, the original license agreement was like, how many pages? I don't remember, but the new one's like 900 pages and has extensive documentation about like Web3.0, blockchain, NFT crap. And as far as I can tell, this is not about preventing others from doing it. This is about making sure that they can do it and others can't. Mm, anywho, hold on. And reason number three, to ensure that OGL is for the content creator slash homebrewer slash aspiring designers, etc., um, as opposed, I guess, to anyone who's looking to commercially profit off of it. But that's the thing. You got to understand, when you create an open ecosystem where people can profit, you create a financial incentive for creativity. That's the whole point. That's what you benefited from. And so now you're basically going, mm, this is going great. Let's get more benefit. All right. There were apparently two principles driving these goals. Uh, be good stewards of the game and that the OGL exists for the benefit of the fans. Nothing, this is a quote, nothing about these principles has wavered for a second. All of the royalty language was apparently meant to apply to large corporations attempting to use OGL content and wasn't meant to impact the vast majority of the community. Man, that's the problem when the lawyers get involved. Even if that's true, even if that was the intent, the problem is that the OGL seemed to give them a lot of flexibility to crack down on pretty much anything that they didn't agree with. The next OGL will contain provisions, this is going back to, back to this, to protect and cultivate an inclusive environment. Education, charity, live streams, cosplay, etc. will remain unaffected. Okay, but man, there's some really, there's some really fine lines here, right? Like, okay... What is cosplay? If I dress up as some D&D &D IP 
character or class of character. What I mean, can can you can you copyright a fucking elf <laughs> at this point, right? I don't think so. So okay, so I so I uh, so I I'm cosplaying some D and D something, and it's it's clearly let's say it's clearly infringing, right? Um, what if I cosplay and I'm in a video? What if that video is monetized? What if I didn't profit, but the maker of the video profited? What if I what if I'm not in a video? What if I'm just at a con? I'm at I'm at like some I'm at PAX or I'm at Comic Con or I'm I'm at something. I'm at some kind of I'm at some kind of gaming convention. What if what if, you know, I mean imagine me, okay? I want to be like a, I want to be a sexy elf, okay? You know, I've got a bikini as part of my as part of my cosplay, right? Exactly, right? So someone slips a someone slips a one to my G string. <laughs> Okay, have I profited now? Is this commercial? <laughs> There's clearly some fine lines here is what I'm trying to say. Now they also say content released under 1.0a will remain unaffected. No royalty structure included, no license back provision under the new OGL, you will own the content you create. Okay? They've also said that the OGL update will not release today, but it is coming. What we saw was a draft sent out to content creators. Nobody drafts a document like, well, okay, yes, you do draft a document like that, but a draft of a document like that is unlikely to be so far off the mark. If it was all about cultivating and inclusivity as opposed to where's my money? Where's my money, bitch? <laughs> um, all right. There was a very cheeky and salty line that was uh, <clears throat> applied to this announcement that is being made fun of online. Second, you're going to hear people say that they won and we lost because making your voices heard forced us to change our plans. Those people will only be half right. They won and so did we. the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Who talks like that? Who sends a letter like that to their customers? That's like, that's like them releasing a fucking t-shirt. That's like... <laughs> Trust me, bro. The new OGL will be epic. <sighs> okay, but seriously, seriously though, in the case of the warranty drama, our track record and our intent was clear. We have always had a basic policy for customer care. Make it right. We got a little slow, okay? We have quadrupled the size of our customer care team. Um, we are actually... I was told that by today we would be down to 24 hours and uh, we haven't actually told anyone yet, but some of the temps I believe will actually be retained because we're going to be building new systems whenever there's downtime when it comes to actually responding to tickets. Uh, one of the things we're going to start doing is combing through reviews on the site for feedback. Uh, we're going to be compiling that for the product development team. So essentially like customer, customer, you know, ticket answer department is going to turn into more of like a customer experience department and is going to be designed to continue to make everything better uh, from response times to uh, to future products to even even like midstream reviews of uh, midstream reviews midstream improvements on existing products you can expect to see all of that from us in the future uh, oh apparently it's called customer satisfaction is that what the department's called okay whatever 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 we end up calling it, it's, it's, it's not just about answering tickets. Um, and the t-shirt was a miscalculation. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I still think it's funny. <laughs> but I live in my head where I knew my intent all along. And the thing that I missed in all of that, the thing I totally missed in all of it, was that a lot of you don't. Right? You don't. 
you don't know what my intention was. And I've told you guys, you know, don't, don't, don't trust or at very most trust, but verify. Right. And so for me, it was very obvious. I'm looking at it going, well, I've got this super long track record of taking care of our community. Also, even if I didn't, I would be insane. I'd be insane to screw anyone over if we actually did. Right. Like, if we actually did, look at how much it blew up when we didn't actually screw anyone over. If we actually just started denying warranty claims on products on our store, it would explode. It would explode the entire techosphere. I'm not a sucker for that kind of punishment. So from my point of view, it was A, I've got this track record, and B, isn't this obvious? Um, but from your point of view... Maybe you were a first-time viewer of that show. Maybe you're a first-time viewer of this show. It's usually not like this. <laughs> Maybe you were a first-time viewer of that show, right? Maybe you'd never ordered from the store before. Maybe you actually had no context whatsoever for what our policies were. And maybe all you saw was uh, quite wealthy <laughs> influencer. That's a reference to last week's show as well. Um, Basically, you know, saying, you know, F you, you want a warranty? Well, you know, go fuck yourself, basically, right? And that was never my intention, uh, but I think we've made good on it. And I think that in the same way, even though they issued this spectacularly stupid statement, um, they still have an opportunity to not screw this up. They still can. They haven't actually released the new OGL. Until they do, they can still reverse course. Well, yeah, okay. So Luke's, Luke's got some thoughts. Um, they have already permanently alienated large parts of the community. This is true. And all in the name of what? Inclusivity? <laughs> Good fucking job. <laughs> um, and they have also... If the idea here was to not allow potential competitors to benefit from their content, man, this was the biggest shot in the arm that they could have possibly given to their competitors. Uh, just this morning, Paizo began solidifying their own OGL. It will apparently be system agnostic, perpetual and irrevocable, an open RPG creative license, ORC. They are looking for a non-profit organization with a history of open source values to own the license. This would be similar to the Linux Foundation and are essentially coming in and saying, even if these guys reverse course, what they've shown is that you're a walking wallet and you can't trust them. I mean, yes, technically the original OGL, technically the original OGL, while it was perpetual, was not irrevocable. They're not probably outside of what is legal, but they are outside of what is, in my opinion, morally acceptable. When I see a perpetual license, that doesn't mean to me, hey, um, this is going really great. I'm creating all of this content uh, in this amazing ecosystem that is going to be, be mine as part of this ecosystem forever. And I can, I can monetize and I can use to hire great creatives to make more content. This is going to be amazing. And we're going to do this forever. And oh, by the way, uh, one day you can say, um, actually, no. And then all of that will change. And now you're gleaning 25% of my revenue. <laughs> no, when I hear perpetual, what I understand is not perpetual, but like then, and then like less perpetual later. <laughs> I think that, I think, you know, from a non-lawyer <laughs> standpoint, I think that means perpetual, right? Like we've got a document called the perpetual WAN show document. Okay, that doesn't mean that every that this WAN show document is perpetual until we decide to make a, a an a, a, a ephemeral a WAN show document. Okay, it's perpetual. This is the only WAN show document. We used to have a separate document every week, but we now have a perpetual WAN show document because that way we don't have to make sure it's shared to all the stupid accounts on all the different computers and everything every week. 
Uh, yeah, team viewer, <laughs> JM Funk 9, 9, 9119 in float plane chat. Yeah, exactly. When I buy a perpetual license to your fucking software, that means it's mine forever, not it's perpetually mine until you decide it isn't mine anymore. No, 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 forget it. Uh, all right, so our discussion questions here. Who should take charge of ORC? I mean, honestly, I don't have enough experience in it to say. Um, how truthful... Oh, this is great. Some of our other discussion questions are really great, though. Uh, Luke... If you think it was truthful that Wizards of the Coast's intent was to stop bigotry and NFTs, say nothing. Or wait, no, don't say it. Say something. Crap. I set that whole thing up and then I got it completely wrong. Fuck. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and not capitalizing, at, or as in orcs versus humans, not ORC. I have no idea what you're talking now. Anyway, I'm talking about now. Um, Luke says, I think you can even say things like your fan slash user base is woefully undermonetized. But yes, yes, this is what I was trying to explain the situation to Yvonne over uh, dinner last night, where she was like, um, sorry, like what's what's going on? Like she. Never, never played Dungeons and Dragons. Like, I mean, she she has kind of a knack for legal documents and like license agreements and stuff these days. Because in the absence of a company lawyer, she did she read a lot of legal documents for us and had to learn to understand them for the most part. Because like even when we had a lawyer uh, in many of the early days. We couldn't just afford to have that lawyer like sit and look at everything. So we would look at it, figure out what our questions are, what sections they needed to look at, and just utilize them as little as possible. Lawyers be expensive, all right? Um, so she hadn't even seen the document, but I'm like kind of trying to explain what's going on. And I'm like, yeah, they're basically, what they're doing is they're taking this existing vibrant ecosystem and they're going, how much can I squeeze it? How much value can I extract? Instead of asking themselves, how much value can I provide? And I don't think anyone would have complained if they had come up with some amazing new offering for their customers and said, hey, but this costs money. They, well, oh, they might have complained, sure. But it wouldn't have been like this. It didn't have to be like this. Um, that would increase monetization... Yeah, so the example that Luke was thinking was, you know, how do you, how do you increase your monetization by offering something new? So instead of offering just t-shirts on LTT Store, we developed a backpack. We developed a screwdriver. Uh, the point is not to just increase the price of t-shirts, which if you guys know, we have never actually done. Our t-shirts are still $19.99 US, which is $20.00. I know. They're still 20 US dollars, just like they always have been, regardless of whether they're blank or printed. Uh, by the way, I have a bit of an update for you guys. We are apparently working with three or four printing shops locally, trying to get some samples in. Uh, the thing that drives me most crazy about our previous printer is that the quality was great. We actually loved working with them. Oh, I keep saying ORC. Uh, when referencing the OpenRGB creative license, but it's apparently ORC. Oh, that makes sense. Hilarious. <laughs> I'm also not technically wrong. It's all caps. Technically right. The best <laughs> kind of right. Actually, the quote is technically correct. But <laughs> let's, get, let's get pedantic today, shall we? Um... Why don't we why don't we get to a couple of merch messages actually? If you guys want to send a message into the show, the way to do it today is through a new feature that we developed to add additional value. We saw a feature that was broken and sucked, merch messages, which don't show up in our dashboard properly. And we went, "Hey, that's stupid. Uh look at this. Here's a here's two merch uh, sorry, did I say merch messages?" Here's two super chats, okay? Here's two super chats. Oh, good. One of them is here. What happened to the other ones? I don't fucking know. Nobody fucking knows. It's gone. So we saw something that was broken. Also, by the way, why are you just giving Google money to build features that don't work properly? That has been broken for two years. Unbelievable. Unacceptable. Merch messages. Man, how long did it take? I like I'm I'm pretty sure the first iteration of merch messages was ready in less than a week. It was amazing. Okay? And 
What's best is that instead of giving Google a big cut of the money that you send to us, you actually get to give it to uh, people like, well, it used to be our t-shirt printer, but anyway, you get to give it to people like uh, Megapro and PH Molds and the companies that we work with on the screwdriver. You get to give it to our, our creator warehouse team who gets paid out of that money. You get to actually get something in the mail, right? You don't just give that money away. You give it to people who are actually making real things that you might actually want to have, like a really nice insulated water bottle. It's better. So... So merch messages were developed so that you guys can interact with the show in a way that is better for everyone. Does it cost money? Yeah. But we have received, like, zero pushback on merch messages. Some people complained we were doing too many of them, but then for every person who complained we were doing too many of them, there was at least three people saying, merch messages are my favorite because it's basically Q&A time. So our response to that was, we do a couple of them early on in the show, so I can talk about how to spend a, how to spend a merch message <laughs> Freudian slip, love it. How to send a merch message. You go on lttstore.com, you pick up something, doesn't matter if you're not, you know, if we don't have anything fresh and new that interests you, you can always just pick up a gift card. Okay, you can spend it later. So you go on lttstore.com, in the checkout, you'll see a place to leave a merch message. It goes to our producer, Dan. What's up, producer Dan? Hello. Um, he will either respond to you, he'll just show your message if you're just like, hey mom, or whatever, happy birthday to a friend or whatever, you can just have it show up down there. Or sometimes he'll curate them so that uh, Luke and I can check them out later. And uh, if we don't get to it, well, hey, at least you get your order in the mail. Heck yeah. Anywho, let's do a couple of them now. And then we'll, right, so I was going to say our compromise was we do a couple of them early in the show. We talk about how to send them. And then we address the rest of them sort of more towards the end of the show when it devolves into absolute chaos. Uh, Dan, hit me with a couple merch messages. Let's go. Okay, I've got one here from Vincent. Uh, so, Linus, uh, out of NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD, who's overall the biggest liar? And out of those, which lie was the most personally offensive? Why did you ask this on the Spicy oh, man. Rand show? Corporations is a liar sometimes, right? Um, <laughs> wow. You specifically called out Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. Now, here's the thing. Companies are made up of departments, which are made up of... Well, okay, no, hold on. Companies are made up of business units, which are made up of departments, which are made up of teams, which are made up of people. So, if I, was to, if I was to zero in on an egregious lie, um, I, I mean, I could, pick, I could pick any one of them. Man, I just about pulled an all-nighter, okay, when AMD's bulldozer processors came out, because our AMD rep at the time told me they were freaking awesome. Sorry, excuse me. Fucking awesome. <laughs> he was like, man... These CPUs slap bitches harder than Dana White. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get into character, okay? <laughs> You're going to kill the pair of us. <laughs> oh. <sighs> anyway, he he tells me <laughs> Get it together, Luke. Anyway, he tells me that the CPU is amazing. At the time, right, I am, I am ghostwriting for Hardware Canucks, which was owned by NCIX. And I'm working on, like, our launch day, you know, coverage. I'm trying to overclock it or whatever. And I'm sitting here, I'm benchmarking late into the night going, this thing's a piece of shit. But I was told it's great. But it's the middle of the night, right the night before the embargo, because I only got it, like, that day. And I'm sitting here going, uh, everyone else is going to make me look like an idiot. I can't publish these numbers. This thing is dog slow. <laughs> and then it comes out, and it's like, it sucks. And I'm sitting here going, well, that would have been great to know. <laughs> um, but, I mean, okay, I was about to say, that's not AMD's fault. AMD does have a culture of overhyping crap products that, that suck. Um, it's usually closer to, you know, white lies, I guess. Or, hmm, I don't know if they're white lies. It's usually closer to bending the truth. I get, hmm, is it? AMD lies. Okay. Intel lies. Lots. Um, NVIDIA, NVIDIA is just a bunch of insidious fucks. Like, let's face it. They, they have a culture of being insidious fucks. 
Um, and don't kid yourself. You know, just because just because Intel dresses nicer and is more respectful to you doesn't mean I mean, these are businesses, right? They exist to separate you from your money. However, there are people there. I want to I want to go back to the other side of this coin, whether it's Nvidia or whether it's Intel or whether it's AMD. I have met some of the most genuine passionate, enthusiastic people that I've ever encountered in the industry. Because all of these companies, insidious fucks that they are, are profitable, which allows them to spend lots of money to attract super passionate, super intelligent people to work on their products. So what I'm trying to say is that corporations is a liar sometimes, absolutely. But corporations is actually also full of enthusiastic, amazing, highly intelligent, honest, people right like i remember running into one of the people that advocated for us uh, for skull trail at intel and he was just like yeah that was like my passion project i was like you're awesome that was so cool it was basically intel's server platform in gamers clothing and overclockable at the time right it was awesome it's bleeding edge made no commercial sense but they did it right you know and it's it's the same thing for companies like nvidia man Man, does NVIDIA ever have great engineers. Like, these are people that are just so smart that you sit down and talk to them for, like, 15 minutes. Like, holy shit. I could have I gone to school for a year, and I wouldn't have learned half as much as I did just now, right? And so when I say these companies are just, like, full of liars and, and, and deceivers, it's true. But these companies are also full of honest, amazing, passionate people who would do it for zero dollars. So what? They're making money. That's great. They should. But they would have done it anyway, which is amazing. you got to love that passion, right? Um, you know what? Let's have a spicy WAN show. It's not one of those companies, but the closest that I would say that I've been to being lied to outright by a company, um, I would say this is fair to say because it was directly from the CEO, and it was a direct deception, uh, something that they would have had intimate knowledge of. Uh, this was around a key product launch. It wasn't from you know a low-level sales rep or marketing rep or even a high-level sales rep or marketing rep. This was directly from the CEO. And I was told from Razer, okay, that their gaming switches back when they first released Razer switches were not rebadged Kaiwa cherry knockoff switches. I was told that they were Razer switches inside and out engineered by Razer. And that was at best, at best, a misrepresentation at the very best. Because they were Kaiwa cherry clones. Moving the actuation point 0.2 of a millimeter is not engineering a switch, okay? The Romer G is engineering a fucking switch. And you can say what you want about the Romer G switch, okay? But that switch was engineered by Omron with input from Logitech. The Razer gaming switch was not engineered by Razer. It involved engineering. You'd be amazed how hard it is to build a screwdriver. And if it's hard to build a screwdriver, I promise you, it's hard to build a keyboard switch. It's a complex mechanism. It's small. The cost needs to, needs to be low. It must be low. It can't be a dollar a switch. Like, you, you, you can't, I mean, you can sell $300 keyboards, but most people <laughs> will not buy a $300 keyboard. There's a limit, okay? And it's got to be reliable within that limit. The millions of times you have to be able to press it. I get it. There was engineering involved, but you did not engineer a switch. A Razer gaming switch, at least back then, right? Okay, so this is like seven, eight years ago, right? At least back then, it was a cherry clone. That's it. I love that uh, this is, yeah, this is great. DBoss2289 float plane says, Linus is gonna, wants to be spicy today and Luke doesn't have any power to stop him this time. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he could. Okay, he could pull the mic. He get the, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, so there. I think that's the I think that's the closest I've ever been to just like or I think that's the most egregiously I have ever been misled by a company. 
Um, and to be clear, I'm not counting. I'm not counting anything that was unintentional. You know, uh, like even if you if you go back and look at like the principal technology scandal at Intel. I had a theory back back during that time that no one would ever go on the record and talk to me about, but I'll say that my theory is basically there there were ignorant executives and their egos involved. Uh, there was skilled people who didn't have the time or chance to review things uh, involved. Uh, basically, bottom line, don't attribute to malice what you can attribute to incompetence or whatever whatever the quote was. I suspect that that was a clown show comedy of errors, uh, not a, a, a willful attempt to deceive the enthusiast community who are the only people watching those stupid presentations anyway and who were obviously going to catch that. Um, you know, that's... That I don't, I don't classify the same way. I just, I just don't. Uh, whereas when you tell me, yeah, we built this thing from scratch and you like actually didn't, that's, that's different. Hit me with another one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about the delay there. I've got one here from, um, well, we'll do this one from, oh geez. I don't know. How about from Reed? Uh, no, I want to save LTX for later. Cody, uh, love the products. Guys, I was wondering if you have any IPB, IPv4 address space and use BGP for anything, and if you guys would ever consider making a video about how all that works. Keep up the good work. Love you guys. Uh, that's, a, that's a no. I mean, yeah, we, we definitely have a small block of IPv4 addresses, but, like, we're not, we're, we're not like, hoarding them or anything. We, you know... Yeah, I, we just we 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 just have them. They're useful. Oh, we have well, a fair number. Oh, okay, cool. Maybe, we should sell yeah. them. All right, cool. Sure. Luke wants to hold on to them. One more. Yeah, sure. Give me one more. Um, got one here from Eric, Jay, and Bob. I've been feeling a ton of burnout at work lately, and I'm considering changing career paths. My question is. Do you have any advice regarding when to go to the higher-ups and complain about issues and when to know they aren't listening and you just must move on? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, well, one thing that I will say as, as, a, as an employer is I really, man, and this is going to, this kind of ties back into a conversation we were having recently about how I really respect people who, who want to better themselves, who want feedback. And I find the legal framework around employment here in BC very frustrating because it prevents me, without opening myself up to liability, from providing feedback to people who are being let go. You know, hey, here's how you could probably make it go better next time. I, I just can't do it. Um, and so, you know, as much as it's like sucks um, that it's like a double standard, I guess, is what I would say as an employer is please talk to me. Right? Give me a chance. If there's something that's making you unhappy, the absolute last thing in the world that I want is for you to just quietly sit there and fester on your unhappiness and be miserable and resentful when, like, honestly, maybe it's something that we could have just fixed. And maybe it might, maybe it wouldn't happen overnight. Like, for example, um, we didn't have an employee retirement savings plan until very recently. Uh, that's something that we added. I think we've got a pretty kick-ass plan now. It's like very competitive. Um, but we, we didn't have one before. Why? Well, because there's a lot of administrative overhead. Uh, it's a significant cost. And I mean, well, yeah, that's why. Basically, there's... It's, and as we've grown and as we've become more profitable and as we've added more people and as we're looking for ways to continue to grow and become uh, a better place to work like my whole thing right has been since day one and i've always i've always done the voice so i'll do the voice again i want to be a real company right is how do we how do we keep improving what if what if you were upset and resentful and the thing that you were so upset about was something that like we were two months from announcing and you up and quit, and that would have been that would have been it, and you would have been happy. Or what if it's something that you know I had been sitting there going like, "Oh man, I really want to do this, but like I don't even know how much appetite there is for it." But all of a sudden, if I if I just start talking about it, 
then people might get the wrong idea. Maybe only, you know, maybe maybe 90% of people would just rather we invest that into hiring more people so that they're not working as hard. Like these are conversations that, especially in the early days, we had a lot. Like I'd sit down with, you know, Luke and Brandon and Taryn and OGs like that. And I'd say, hey, look, coming into this year, um, I could pay you more. <laughs> However, you'd have to keep working at this pace. <laughs> Or I could hire more people. I'm kind of leaning towards door number two here. What do you guys think? And, you know, I, I think I got it right for the most part. Um, and, you know, obviously that doesn't mean that we were just freezing pay at, at, at any stage and all of that. Like we were, we were, we were constantly trying to, to, to do better as far as that went as well. It's a balancing act, right? But we were also trying to, so we're trying to make the place a better place to work while also adding more people, building more infrastructure. The point is that I want to know, I need to know, because if I don't know what people want, I'm just guessing. What's up? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I think Luke has some strong feelings about this. Uh, if you really need and want to fix, uh, don't just bring the problem. Find a reasonable solution and suggest it. Um, maybe even make them think it was their idea mm. by bringing them to that conclusion. I'm sure he's done it to me. Um, yeah. I mean, it's... It's communication 101. Whether you're whether you're in the supervisory or the reporting to how, how do I how do I describe these roles? Whether whether you're higher on the on the pyramid chart, the the company what 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 was it called? Pyramid pyramid? Is that what it's called? What's the company org chart? Whether you're higher on the org chart or lower on the org chart, it is such an important communication skill to bring people ideas in a way that is non-confrontational. If I can bring you an idea and make you feel like you can relate with my struggle and that my solution sounds super reasonable to you, then the chances of implementing it are much, much higher. With all of that said, the second part of your question is, hey, when do I go, this is a lost cause and just bail? There's a solid chance that that's going to be it. Uh, one, of, one, of our, one of our rock stars, okay, Kyle from Creator Warehouse Engineering, love Kyle, he's great. Um, you know, a big problem for him at a previous position, I'm not going to say it was the one right before this, I'm not going to say if it was two before this, we're not going to name any names here. But at a previous position, he had expressed some concern about um, basically some costs that were associated with his remaining employed there, him remaining employed there. Okay? The situation was going to become untenable for him. He wasn't even asking for a raise. He wasn't just like, give me more money. He just, he just had, there were some costs that were associated with him working there that he needed some solution to. And in effect, they basically said, deal with it. And he did. And he came here. Right? Well, eventually. So that could happen. Some people just, they don't care about you. Um, they, they see you as, I, I, I hate the word, I hate the term HR. Um, they see you as human resources. Effectively, warm bodies that can be mined for productivity. Um, and, and that's just the way, that's just the way it's going to be. And you just have to, you know, karma's a bitch, right? Like, you just have to hope that at some point that's going to bite them in the ass and no one's going to want to work for them. And honestly, I think we're seeing a lot of that today. Labor shortage? There's no fucking labor shortage. How many resumes you get? Thousand resumes or whatever for some positions? Yeah, a lot, a lot. No labor shortage. You got a pay and benefits shortage. That's your problem. Figure it out. And like the thing that drives me most crazy is like McDonald's food doesn't fucking cost more in places where they pay a living wage. It's still cheap. Why? Because it is. You're just taking more of it. <laughs> so just pay more of it. Uh, anywho. All right, let's move on to, uh, we should get some sponsors. We should get some sponsors out of the way. We got to pay for, uh, Gonna pay for all this somehow. 
The show is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors. During whose reads here, I am not going to use any profanity because that's just not in my nature. Uh, starting with, help me out, Dan. Notion. Notion is an easy-to-use platform to actually commit to your goals this year and see them through. You can use Notion to plan, track, and do all of your work in the same space. It's great for collaboration with one place to share ideas and work together on everything from group projects to vacations. It allows you to take notes, manage tasks, set goals, and so much more. Oh, man. I should have Yvonne use this. Uh, we're, we're trying to put together a family trip sometime this coming year, um, and there's like... There's friends involved and family members involved and spouses and children of them and once removed, you know, acquaintances of theirs. And getting everybody on the same page is a nightmare. Anywho, uh, you can build your Notion to be your own personalized home base for anything you want to track in 2023. It's very customizable, so you can tailor the tools to fit your team or your own needs. You can make your workspace beautiful and fun to use, too, with your favorite emojis, GIFs, images, uh, whatever you want. With Notion, the world is your oyster. Uh, many of us in the office use Notion. Oh, I actually didn't know. That's cool. Uh, even personally, to seamlessly manage and collaborate on different projects around the office. I, uh, okay, I, I've got to try this. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for Notion today for free using the link in the video description. The show is also brought to you by FreshBooks. I'm guessing you're not an accountant. <laughs> I mean, statistically speaking. You're probably not an accountant. Uh, and working on your books can bring up very difficult questions, like what numbers go in what column? <laughs> and what report should I be looking at? What is, I mean, we talked about this last week. What is earnings versus net profit? What is gross profit? How, wh how, how does all of this compare, right? Uh, FreshBooks is an easy-to-use accounting solution that makes it simple to send invoices and collect your cash. And just keep track of things, man. FreshBooks was created specifically for both business owners and accounting professionals, hitting a sweet spot between usable and useful. Plus, it keeps your income and expenses organized so you won't be begging your accountant for help the day before taxes are due. It has everything you need to manage your books, like invoicing, expense and time tracking, automated payments, and reports to tell you how healthy your business is. Don't wait. Go to freshbooks.com slash when to save 90% on your first four months. I think that's a new offer. That's super cool. So go check it out. That's a really nice long trial period, too, because it gives you time to actually get familiar with it. The show is also brought to you by Squarespace, who we pay for. I only found that out a couple of shows ago, I think. We are paying customers of Squarespace. We actually use them. Um, running your own business can be hard, but making your website doesn't have to be. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to get your website up and running quickly. You can grow your business online through their marketing features, including SEO support, email campaigns, and social tools. And they have a wide selection of award-winning mobile-optimized templates. And their commerce platform comes with everything you need from merchandising to checkout. Plus, if you need help, Squarespace offers webinars, guides, and has a 24-7 support team that is ready to help you out. We love Squarespace so much, we use it for LinusMediaGroup.com and LTXExpo.com, which you guys should keep your eyeballs glued to for updates. LTX Expo is happening this year. So go to Squarespace.com forward slash when to get 10% off today. Next topic. Man, I'm kind of feeling the uh, Windows 8.1 end of support. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. Windows 8.1 reached end of support on Tuesday, January 10th. This sucks. I actually still have an active Windows 8.1 right now. It's not like normal Windows 8.1. It's Windows 9. Uh, that, that sort of stripped down 8.1 embedded or whatever it was called um, that we made a video about. I, man, I looked at that thing. I was like, man, it's fucking snappy. This is amazing. And so I immediately set it up on a VM that to this day I still use. Um, so I'm going to have, man, I'm going to have to like update that thing. That sucks. Cause like, that's my sketchy VM that I've just used for like, oh, this is like a weird program. Okay. Let's, um, let's disconnect it from the rest of the network and see what it does. Like, and it's so, because it's so bare bones, it's really easy to tell if anything is there that's not supposed to be there and stuff like, ah, man, I just, I love that VM. <laughs> It's, it's been through a lot with me. Anyway, uh, technical support, software updates, and security fixes will no longer be provided. You're not going to say anything. 
And Microsoft is recommending that customers move to a more current version of Windows. They are not offering a free upgrade path from Windows 8.1 to Windows 10 or 11. Um, and unlike what happened with Windows 7, Microsoft will not be offering an extended security update program for Windows 8.1, probably because nobody would even want it. The ESU program for a number of older products actually also came to an end on Tuesday, including Windows 7 Professional and Enterprise versions and Windows Server 2008 R2. Fun fact, I was actually using Windows Vista earlier this week. And Windows 8.1 is not going to be as bad as that. But I can tell you, using an outdated version of Windows, it gets pretty rough after a while. So it was good up until I think it was about two years ago. We got our hands on the Dell XPS M2010, I think it's called. It's a wild laptop. I can't imagine they made more than like hundreds of these, if even that. Like I, I can't even imagine who would buy this thing. But uh, we got our hands on it and that thing shipped with Windows Vista. And apparently it was pretty good up until just a couple of years ago when um, support for, uh, when Chromium, stopped supporting Vista. So effectively, you couldn't do anything in a browser. I think Valve pulled support for Vista and Steam uh, around that time as well. Don't quote me on that. I, I could have the timing a, a little bit off. But man, you try to do anything on Vista today, and it's bad. Even ignoring the security issues, let me tell you. I, I, tried, I, tried, to load up, uh, I tried to load up RottenTomatoes.com, okay? so that I could check reviews for, for a Blu-ray to determine if I was willing to risk losing it in the, uh, the pop-up uh, motorized optical drive on the top of this laptop. Guys, do not miss that video. Um, I was like, do I care about this Blu-ray? Uh, <laughs> and then I could manually calculate the percentage of thumbs up and thumbs down reviews because I could, I could see how many there were, but the actual images weren't, weren't loading. <laughs> It was, it was pretty rough. Um, our discussion question here is, where would you rank Windows 8 slash 8.1 on a best to worst list of Windows versions? This is one of those things that's kind of like 98, 98 SE and ME, where the lines are a little blurry. You can't ask me, where would you rank Windows 8 slash 8.1? Because Windows 8 and 8.1... Let's just say Microsoft learned a lot from Windows 8, and Win Windows 8.1 was far less of a piece of shit. Um, I would rank Windows 8... Oh, man. See, I liked Vista. So let's go... Matt, you know what? That'd be kind of a fun video. Like, ranking, ranking Windows. And like just like Windows tier list. Um, yeah. Oh, that could be a fun float plane exclusive. Doing like... Uh, hey, 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 Dan. Uh, can you uh, can you ping the social team and actually CC James and let them fight it out over whether that's an LTT video or whether it's a float plane exclusive, just like kind of casual social video. But we should do we should do like a Windows tier list. Uh, just I, a Windows tier list? I wasn't listening at all. Yeah, Windows tier list. Done. So we take all the editions of Windows and we have people we have people rank them best to worst. Even good pre NT Windows like DOS based Windows ninety eight SE was not very good. It crashed a lot. It had a lot of compatibility issues in spite of the fact that it was running on top of DOS. DOS programs just would not work a lot of the time. Um, I think it's hard to call Windows 8 legitimately worse than anything before the NT kernel. But I would say that Windows 8 was probably the worst of the post-NT kernel operating systems for me. Like... 11 has its issues, but they're not stability issues. Uh, they're not just like utterly making it utterly unusable issues with a keyboard and mouse, right? Um, you know, and and Windows 8, as I talked about before with the, the Windows 9 experience, <sighs> could get wildly better. Um, like I would... I mean, I've told you guys, eight point, if, if, I, if I could have had the latest versions of DirectX supported, there is no reason why I couldn't have just continued running 8.1 embedded with modifications, kept running Windows 9 until today. Mm -hmm. There is no reason for me to not do that. It is so usable. Start menu search works fine. It's much easier to get at your network configuration panel. Oh, you don't have that bullshit, terrible control panel 
that's just like sits on top of the regular control panel and makes everything more difficult. Actually, I think you did have a little bit of that, but it wasn't as bad. The whole regular control panel was still there, damn it. Yeah, no, I, I, I liked 8.1 with the right tweaks. I, but then I liked Vista, so what the, <laughs> the fuck do I know? <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> I was running Vista on modern hardware. Mm. I didn't try to plug in my old 98 Sierra printer. That's a big difference, right? Windows Vista worked great on a brand new computer playing current gen games. Because it was what everyone was validating with. Uh, yeah, okay. Luke, on the other hand, worked at Geek Squad in the Windows Vista days, and <clears throat> it was a bloodbath of low-spec laptops. Yeah, that's, I think that's very fair to say. Uh, as, if you had the specs for it, it ran great. If you were, but if you were running, like, 32-bit Vista on some piece of crap laptop, it was, it was a pretty bad time. Pretty bad time. All right, why don't we do, uh, let's do two more merch messages and then uh, we'll move into another topic. Hit me, Dan. Okay, I gotta find them. Whoa. Okay, here I thought we that's your whole job over there is finding merch messages. Yeah, but. Uh, I mean, he also monitors the audio. I gotta scroll down to he, it. He helps you guys listen to the echo. <laughs> go, 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 go. Stop go. it. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I think we got that one done too. You got this. Do you mean to do a quick topic while you look nope, through it? No, I got Matthias. Uh, loving the super edgy episode, laughing throughout the whole show. Question for Linus. Do you take any actions to protect the long-term health of your voice with all the hosting of episodes and live shows? Excited for LTX and LTTstore.com. Uh, no. No, I can't say that I do, but one of the things that I do do... Nice. Uh, one of the things I do is I just use my natural talking voice. I'm not, I'm not putting on a voice for you guys. I, I'm louder, and that's something I've tried to work on. But every time, yeah, every time I'm quieter... Okay, why don't I try? I will simply speak... I oh, see, I can't do it. I, Im I immediately start ramping up. Part of it is that when I'm on camera, I'm usually talking about something that I can get kind of fired up about. Uh, otherwise, why are we making a video about it? Like, I was, oh, man. I was in script review with, um... Oh, crap. What's that? Oh, yeah, right. I was in script review with Tanner today, and it's anyone outside of my office probably thought I was laying into him. Because I was sitting there, I was sitting there going, How the fuck is this even still a problem in 2023? How is this even fucking possible? Right, you know, but I was, I was actually, at, you know, Tanner's more of a subdued kind of guy. He wouldn't say it like that, but it's not like he didn't agree. What I was talking about was the challenge of sharing files from one device to another. You know, Apple's kind of got it solved, but it doesn't count as solving it when you only solve it for people that are made of money and can afford an entire ecosystem of your products. That's, fuck you, right? Like, that's not a solution. That's not a... That's not a real solution. What I want is a real solution. If I need to beam you a file from my phone to your laptop, that shit should be simple. It is 20 fucking three. Right? So anyway, the point is that even when I'm not on camera, I can, I can get kind of, I can get kind of passionate about things, but that's just my, that's just like my voice. And so when I'm on camera, that happens a lot. And... I mean, drink water? <laughs> well, you know? LTTstore.com. <laughs> Bitches. <laughs> I should have waited till he drank. Almost got him earlier with the slap. <laughs> do, do you want another one? Or we... uh, yeah, give me one more. Oh, uh... <laughs> Uh, okay, this is from uh, Daniel, not me. Uh, getting some birthday merch. Linus, what is a product that you will probably never be able to make, but would like to make? Oh, man. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things I'd, I'd love to be able to make. Um, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, socks. I mean, we'll get it. We're going we're gonna to nail the socks. Don't you worry. Um, 
sandals. Sandals may never happen. Just the, the mold costs for all the different sizes that you got to do. I'd love to do a better sandal. Like, man, the... See? I'm going to get all passionate again. <laughs> okay? The failure point on every pair of sandals I've ever owned is the same. So why don't you just reinforce it, you fucks? That's your whole job is to make sandals. So what? You don't know how they come apart? Like, how is that even possible? No one... Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, I was trying... I'm trying to navigate to, like, a local rec center on my way home. Okay? And I'm using my voice because I'm a responsible person. I'm operating a motor vehicle. So I press my button on my steering wheel. Hold my button on my steering wheel. I go, okay. Navigate to whatever the name of it is. Now, I happen to have an entry in my address book that is some other place of business that starts with that same region, okay? So I'm not going to say exactly what it is. I don't need to disclose any of this. But, you know, let's say, say for example, I was trying to go to uh, um, uh, Alder Grove Recreation Center, and I also happened to have an entry for Alder Grove Dental Clinic. Three fucking times in a row. It utterly ignored Recreation Center and navigated me to the dental clinic. <laughs> three times, three times in a row. With all the AI shit that Google does in 2023, how is it fucking possible that when I say, call Yvonne Ho, it says, I'm sorry, I don't have a number for Yvonne Home. <laughs> Ho! <laughs> Ho! How is it possible that when I say, call Hoffman Wong, it says, I'm sorry, I don't have an entry for Hoffman. Sometimes it's spelled with two fucking N's. You know how I fixed it? I took the second N off the end of his name. How is that even possible? If I say, call Jake Tyvee, okay, you check. How many fucking Jakes are in my address book? Jake Tivy? Close enough. If I say call Jake Tivy, it works. Okay, it's the same with James. Right? Call James Stribe. Calling James Streeb. No, 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 no. I said it this way. You repeat after me. How is it even possible? Okay? Because I know they have it. I know they have the technology to take whatever the phonetic version of that would be, cache it, and then give you, and then return a probability match. Probability match. Okay? Not a perfect match. Fine. Give me the 85% one that's in my local storage. <laughs> Sorry. What were we talking about? I don't remember. I don't remember what the question was. What what kind of product do you want to make? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. How about a how about a voice assistant that isn't complete dog shit? How about one of those? Could use one of those. All right. Uh, let's do another topic. Ooh, Intel releases the first six gigahertz CPU. Good for them. <laughs> um, this is funny. Mercedes is going to be offering level 3 self-driving in America. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> poor, poor Anthony put together this topic for us. We're Damn it, we're going to read it. Uh, after CEO Pat Gelsinger teased it during the Innovation 2022 keynote, Intel on Thursday formally released the i9-13900KS. It is binned, apparently, through a unique selection process. So, binning. Uh, it has the same core and cache layout, but with higher base and boost clocks. It is apparently a world's first... 6 gigahertz CPU. This is versus 5.8 for the non-S version of it. <clears throat> uh, its E chorus boosts the same, though. So it's only the P chorus that will boost higher, which is fine because from a gaming standpoint, that's all you really need. Uh, Hardware Unboxed got their hands on the new chip and released a review at launch. Unsurprisingly, they're fast. Yep, they're fast. They're at the top of the graph. Um, there's a slight problem, though. Aside from the whopping 280 watts of power... Uh, that it drew at its 5.5 gigahertz all-core frequency. Wow. Um, okay. Um, 
it's really expensive. It's $100 more than the CPU it's based on. That's 17% more for about 3% better performance. And this does not factor in AMD, whose $400 7700X isn't that far off in gaming. To get the best gains out of the 1300KS, it goes without saying that you will need to also spend a bunch of money. Uh, like you'll need fast DDR5 7200 memory that gained an additional 3% FPS, though <clears throat> that might apply to the 13900K as well. So the question becomes, if I really need 3% more performance, are there other ways to do it? Maybe. And then do I need another 3%? Let's fucking go! <laughs> Let's get the KS! Um... Yeah, I mean, Luke's got a good point. You know, he thought it would actually be more than $100 more. Uh, very few of these things will probably exist. And going back to, you know, like uh, third-party binning services like Silicon Lottery back when they existed, these highly binned chips would often cost a lot more. So from that point of view, you're probably right. It's downright reasonable because you have to understand what you're buying. You are buying essentially hand-picked silicon. Maybe not by an actual hand, but certainly a robot <laughs> hand. Uh, certain things that you'd really prefer a human hand to do. But I think robot hand is good enough for this. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, Silent Luke? <laughs> Again, I should have waited for him to drink. <laughs> I want to get that computer wet. And computers <laughs> love me. I turn them on. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, I really shouldn't be making him laugh. For those of you who are wondering what the fuck is going on with the WAN show, um, we, are, we are doing a little Jay and Silent Bob cosplay because uh, Luke had some fairly significant oral surgery earlier this week. He cannot really speak comfortably, uh, but we've got a bit of a streak going. Uh, we got to figure out exactly which was the first show that we, that we did. Um, or not the first show we did, but we've got to figure out how far back we have to go before it was not me and Luke on the WAN show. I, I'm pretty sure we're over two years at this point where neither of us has missed a WAN show, regardless of work trips, family vacations, uh, statutory holidays, surgery. Um, <laughs> and in the interest of keeping the streak alive, Luke actually scheduled his procedure as far away as possible from Wan Show um, and had intended to be on the show today talking, but has had some complications today that prevented him from per fully participating. So uh, I don't remember whose idea it was, but we came up with the idea of, okay, well, if you're going to, was this me? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I have some stupid fucking ideas. Um, so we came up with the idea of cosplaying as Jay and Silent Bob. So there would be a reason for <laughs> him to be silent. And then this topic with, uh, YouTube demonetizing channels for swearing excessively kind of was perfect because I needed an excuse to talk about fucking pussy and <laughs> right like if I'm, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be the character what I'm gonna I'm gonna like bleep things <laughs> can't do that shit uh anyway Intel has dreamed of speeds of 6 gigahertz for 20 years, with their last serious attempt being the Pentium 4 netburst architecture derived Tejas. Tejas? I forget how to pronounce Tejas. Um, but the Pentium, Pentium 5. Uh, these chips were intended to push past 5 gigahertz to an ultimate goal of 10 gigahertz plus, but they just couldn't do it, and Tejas was canned by 2004 in favor of the lower clocked Pentium M based core CPUs. Gigahertz doesn't matter came true. Um, as we reach the limits of simply adding more cores, and with both teams pushing clocks again instead, might gigahertz matter once more? The answer is they always will. They always have and they always will. All else being equal, more gigahertz is more faster. But the thing is that a lot of efficiencies were gained by building a more... Um, a more power efficient architecture, especially as we moved into the multi-core era, such that gigahertz was not the only answer to the problem. So I think there's always going to be a little bit of, of ebb and flow. Are we chasing gigahertz or are we chasing architectural efficiencies? Uh, realistically, for a long time, it's just kind of been a little bit of both. Discussion question is, what direction do you see the industry going and in following this milestone? More clock speed, more cache, more cores, more power, or something else? 
Uh, I don't think we can really push power much higher, at least not for monolithic dies. Um, we saw with AMD's release of the non-X7000 series CPUs that at even pretty high power draw, a chiplet design spreading out that, uh, that power dissipation helps a lot with thermal management. Like, yeah, it's still a ton of heat. You still need a big fat heat sink, but you're not going to have these hot spots that are absolutely going to kill any attempt to cool these things. Like, that's the thing, right? Is you could have a 100 watt chip, right? That is impossible to cool because the die is so small that the physics of moving the heat away from it fast enough are impossible, right? Or... You could have a 400 watt chip in a server that's this fucking big, has chiplets all over the damn thing, and yeah, you need a big heat sink on that bitch, but like... <laughs> but it's not a problem to get the heat out of the chip into that heat sink. So, I don't see us pushing power much higher for desktop chips where realistically wafers are going up in price, not down, and we're not going to see significantly larger dies. So we're, we've just reached a point where we can't really move heat. I mean, Intel's already thinning out, not just the IHS. They've been thinning the die for multiple generations now to try to get heat out of it more efficiently. Like, like we are at the, we are at the razor's edge of what's possible now. Um, I do see them, I do see them continuing to try to push clock speed as much as they can, but it's hard to do without more power. So, man, what are you, what are you going to see? More cash is going to be tough. Man, I'm, sound, I'm sounding like a, I'm sounding like like a bad news bearer here. Uh, more cash is going to be tough. We've seen news coming out of TSMC that the latest node shrinks are not really making cash any smaller, which is <laughs> pretty tough for AMD's strategy of throwing more cash at their chips to dramatically boost gaming performance. I think the X3Ds of this generation are going to be pretty freaking expensive. AMD's going to be able to point at their non-Xs and say, hey, we're still a great value, right? AM5 is a great platform, great value, but you want to go fucking fast, you're going to have to pay some fucking money, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think Luke, uh, Luke's right. Chiplets are 100% the future. But, I mean, what? You, do you really want more cores? I mean, yeah, yeah your team works in development. You're going to parallelize everything? Good fucking luck. Ultimately, single core. Yeah, single core performance is always going to matter. Yeah, it's always going to matter. And it's still it's still a bottleneck today, like no matter no matter what you're doing, it still matters. Um, all right, let's move on to our uh, oh this is oh this is a big topic. Praise Saint Cook, hero of the people. Uh, Tim Cook voluntarily takes a forty percent pay cut. <laughs> On Thursday, Apple announced that CEO Tim Cook would be taking a 40% pay cut going from $84 million last year to just $49 million this year. Okay, I don't really know if I like your attitude. This is some pretty sad shit right here. <laughs> How's Tim Cook's family going to have generational wealth now? <laughs> this decision was made after the company's board committee... I mean, it doesn't sound like an excited committee. I guess they get to talk about how much more money Tim Cook makes than them. Uh, <laughs> the decision was made after the company's board committee on executive compensation balanced shareholder feedback, Apple's exceptional performance, and a recommendation from Mr. Cook, okay, for real though, uh, to adjust his compensation in light of feedback received. Uh, Tim's annual basic salary will remain $3 million, with a bonus of up to $6 million. Uh, what's changing is his stock award target, which will be cut to $40 million as opposed to the $75 million that he received last year. Uh, last year, Apple apparently wanted to pay Cook a $99 million pay package, but shareholder advisory firm ISS said it was too much. <laughs> This is very interesting. Like, once you get into these numbers that are just so far beyond, like, any reasonable amount of money, uh, like, okay, tell me something, Luke. Okay, what, 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 what does this work out to? Even now, $49 million a year, so that works out to a seventh of a million dollars a day. So about, about $130 million a day, all right? Or a thousand, thousand, sorry, excuse me. $130,000 a day. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, can we become a shareholder firm that says too much? <laughs> yeah, advisory firm. Okay, so one hundred thirty thousand dollars a day, Luke. Could you spend a hundred? What was that work out to per per waking hour? So so you're awake for what? Let's say sixteen hours. Okay, so you make uh, about eight thousand dollars a waking hour. Um, oh man, I was pretty close. Nice. Okay, you make eight thousand dollars an hour. Could you spend eighty dollars in a minute? Could you spend eighty dollars every minute? Like, what kind of food? What kind of fucking food would you eat? Like, how long? At the rate that you eat, my God, you could never. <laughs> he could eat forever on that amount of money. He could. I mean, this fucking guy could eat forever on like. A thousandth of that, a, a, a one hundred thousandth of that. God, you eat so slow. It's You'd think he wouldn't be able to get as big as he is. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Yeah, you're going to be pretty slow at eating now. Unless you're eating that pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, the, I'm supposed to be Jay, right? That's what he would say. Gets right into it. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually hurting him. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anywho, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna make it clear. We actually um, did praise uh, the late CEO of Nintendo for taking a 50% pay cut uh, after the lukewarm launch of the 3DS and the failure of the Wii U. Um, right, like that. It, it is actually a pretty cool thing for a CEO to take a pay cut when the company doesn't perform well because why should why should other people's jobs get cut like that stupid sad CEO talking about like crying about how hard it was to lay people off <sighs> crocodile tears right like how how much are you going to cry when it's your family that's worried about where their next meal is going to come from um and to be clear I'm not saying that I'm some kind of like you know softy I would never you know fire anyone like that that happens that's business but, you know, when you're doing it because the company overall didn't perform, well, shit rolls up a hill. Like, exe the executive team has to, has to take accountability for that, right? Um, the difference is that Awada's basic annual salary was $770,000 with up to $2.11 million of performance-based bonuses. Um, it wasn't... Three million dollars with six million dollars of bonuses and another seventy-five million dollars of performance-based bonuses, or a stock 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 award target. Um. Uh, Jacob Chgo says apparently internally at Apple, everyone spent the entire day mocking him. I can't validate that. Uh, I, you know, I have no idea, but it wouldn't surprise me. Like. Anyway, um, so yeah, good luck with that, Tim. Um, hopefully, your hopefully your private jet payments don't fall behind. All right, what else we got? Um, mm, this is an ultra rapid fire topic. Uh, the LTT subreddit brought to my attention that uh, Anchor was still using me as a spokesperson on their site. Uh, hey, thanks subreddit. Um, you know, post it on the forum next time. <laughs> But uh, no, subreddit is cool too. Uh, anyway, it's gone. Uh, we've got that all dealt with. So here's their site. Uh, if you guys uh, weren't keeping up with the drama, we dropped Anchor as a sponsor after their Eufy sub-brand security cameras uh, were marketed on Big Fat Lies. Uh, we, were, we were not super happy about the way that whole thing went down. Oh, it's great. Okay, so Lou just gets more. <laughs> he just gets a wider <laughs> spot, I guess. Uh, all right, cool. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Uh, all right, we got a couple more topics here. Mercedes will be offering level three self-driving in the U.S., and they will be the first in front of Tesla. Uh, they got approval from the state of Nevada, and they will be the first to offer a production vehicle with level three driving. Uh, the jump from level two systems, which include Tesla's autopilot and Cadillac's super cruise systems, is a substantial leap and includes, apparently, environmental detection capabilities that allow the system to make informed decisions, such as accelerating to pass a slow-moving vehicle. 
Level 3 systems, to be very clear, still require a human driver to remain ready to take over control at the system's request. So you can't just, you know, have, have someone suck in your dick while you're behind the wheel. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could as long as you're ready to take over control at the system's request. Just don't let it, just make sure it's not a, make sure it's not a good blow job, not too distracting. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. And uh, anyway, Audi's 2019 A8 sedan was supposed to be the first production vehicle with level three features in Europe, but ultimately they decided the market and infrastructure wasn't ready back in 2020. Um, this is, this is pretty exciting. I still, man, I, uh, my new car has some like assist features, like even like lane keep assist, man, I drive without it on. I just, I like to drive my car. I feel like I thought I was going to be all automation all the time when it came. I don't know. I don't know if I'm that into it. Maybe like sometimes, like if I gotta, if I'm work, if I have to work or something, just like sit in the back seat and work while the car drives itself, that'd be kind of cool. But I, I like to drive. I also have a pretty nice car. I, I'm, I'm actually really liking the new car. It's, I, I, I never really cared. I was ne I've never been a car guy. But um, I, I definitely am. I definitely am liking the new car. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Still, yeah, 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 yeah. Luke likes it too. Uh, what, what is it? Not good enough for blowjobs? Is that? Wait, wait were, did you say that before I? Oh, my car's automated driving. Well, yeah, no, it's not even close. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> I tried to give a blowjob in that car. <laughs> it's like awful. The bolster's on the seat. I can't even reach the passenger seat. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and do some um, some merch messages here? Don't don't, don't say that. Um, okay, merch. Messages. Oh, don't. Okay, that's fine. Then no, okay. in that case, now we got some jobs. We got some jobs. Let's go. Let's do jobs. Yeah. Oh wow, we have different pages for different companies now. Look at this. Okay, so there's there's jobs, 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 float plane jobs. Uh, junior backend developer, Luke, you got to correct this if any of this is wrong. Is this all right? Full-time backend web developer, uh, full-time front-end developer, uh, full-time machine learning slash computer vision engineer. Um, okay, why work here? Equal opportunity statement, job perks. Um, hey, hey, we don't have our, we don't have our bloody uh, thing, the good thing that we have, the, the GRSP plan. Okay, we got to get that shit in here. Hey, Dan, do you mind uh, just sending a message over to uh, HR? Yep. And uh, whoever manages this website. That should be really quick to put up there because of Squarespace. Okay, for Creator Warehouse, we need a full-time senior retention marketing specialist. Okay, whatever the hell that is. Uh, full-time electronics engineer slash product designer. A full-time fit technician. Got to make more garments. All right, cool. So we got that. And then, oh, 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 uh-oh. But, uh, but, um, there we go. What's going on here? Uh, oh, are not in hiring right now, but they will be this year and we'll be using the resume. Oh, okay. So bear that in mind. Uh, we will be hiring those positions. Uh, and honestly, like if it's stellar, I'm sure we would just make it work. But sometimes, you know, timing's not always perfect. So, uh, okay. And then Linus Media Group is looking for a full time procurement manager. Full-time sales supervisor, full-time lo logistics coordinator, full-time accountant, full-time bookkeeper, full-time video editor slash camera op, full-time social media coordinator, full-time writer slash video producer, full-time production assistant, and uh, yeah, we're, man, we're hiring a lot of positions. Uh, you, want, you want me to look at your thing, right? <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Also, the jobs on the float plane page are not only for float plane, which is confusing. Yeah, I think they're just jobs that you're going to have to hire for. That kind of makes sense. Sort of. Not really. But yes. But no. But yes. Uh, anyway. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> Good chat. All right. Okay. Oh. No, we got one more topic. Let's do our last big topic, and then we'll get into some good merch messages. You guys probably noticed we didn't promote really anything on the store today. Um, that is for us to have one more big push this weekend. We actually do have a couple products that we could launch, uh, but I talked to Nick about it. Um, Adam, our, our new customer experience uh, supervisor, and we basically went, okay, look, let's not do a big burst of sales this weekend. Um, let's save it. 
Let's get everything completely caught up. Our goal for this year is to measure our customer support response times in hours, um, not in days. So we're going to get everything completely cleaned up next week. And then next week, hopefully we'll have like a good promo for you guys or a big launch or something like that. All right. 7900 XTX problems. After its release in December, the AMD 7900 XTX um, has had some issues. There have been a number of users reporting that it was hitting hotspot temps above 110 degrees and slowing the GPU down. AMD started by saying this was normal, but soon after they admitted that some reference cards suffered a manufacturing defect in the vapor chamber. AMD was then interviewed by Gordon at PC World, and according to Der Bauer, uh, some questionable statements were made. In the interview, Scott Herkelman from AMD said, is there a performance issue? What we found is if you throttle at 110 degrees in certain workloads, you can see a small performance delta. Hmm. Okay. This did not line up with Derbauer's <laughs> testing that showed that three out of four cards he tested could only dissipate 250 to 280 watts of power consistently, 80 watts lower than it should be, which can drop performance by 10 to 20%. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. <coughs> gotta protect my voice whoops <laughs> the problem appears to be stemming from not enough liquid in the vapor chambers what's strange is that amd says they traced the problem to a bad batch of coolers and that customers can get in touch with customer support to figure things out but that doesn't really make sense because if it only affected a single batch it should be relatively simple to use serial numbers to figure out where those cards are and preemptively recall them um i mean yeah is it, it's, yeah, like, why are they relying on customers to test a $1,000 GPU to figure out if it's defective? Like, what are they, what are they, your RMA department? Um, this either means that the defect isn't confined to a single batch, or that AMD just doesn't really care, and as long as these GPUs don't die within the warranty period, they're just ultimately not going to be their problem. <sighs> the larger problem is that AMD is super low on 7900 XTX stock, so only about one out of three of customers affected will be able to get a replacement card in the first two weeks in Germany. <sighs> Der Bauer recommends just taking a refund from AMD and buying an AIB 7900 XTX instead of waiting for AMD to replace your reference card. Or, if this is just kind of like, um, fucking stupid, you could just not buy an AMD card, but then you're supporting NVIDIA, who has their own problems. I know, right? There's been some speculation that GPUs have died as a result of this hotspot. So Derbauer received a broken card from a viewer to tear down, and you absolutely should watch the moment that he turns it on for the first time. Not safe for nerds. Um, when, with the disassembly done, it looks like there was a faulty VRM, so the hotspot temp had nothing to do with the GPU dying. Uh, with a better cooler, it still would have let out the magic smoke, though. Uh, some bonus not safe for nerds content. 6900 XTs are also appearing to be dying in large numbers, with, on, with one German shop receiving 48 dead GPUs. Uh, the picture of one of the GPUs is truly horrific. Hmm. Let's see. Yikes. Mm. Wow, did that die just crack? What makes a die crack? Oh, it came off on the cooler. Why would it come off on the cooler? What the hell? Wow. Okay. Huh. With that said, 48 is not necessarily an enormous number. It just depends on how many this particular, uh, this particular store sold. Yeah. Some people are speculating that a driver issue caused this, although much like the faulty VRM GPU that Der Bauer showed, um, ugh, it is possible for a driver to kill a GPU, like for real. Like a driver could potentially tell it to, to draw way too much power. Um, or it could, it could disable uh, a thermal safety. You know, yeah, it's possible. But I, I think that's fairly unlikely. Um, our discussion question is, if you were AMD, how would you try and solve the bad vapor chamber problems? I mean, I mean we had some problems with screwdrivers. We contacted everyone who bought one. Uh, we had them keep their existing driver. We don't serialize the screwdrivers because, how, like, realistically, there's, there's, no, there's no onboard programming. Like, we wouldn't have a way of actually serializing them that couldn't be uh, that couldn't be forged, right? So what are we going to do? Have a different plastic mold for every stupid driver? <laughs> what are we going to put a sticker on it? Like whatever. We don't serialize them. So what we had people do was just mark the ones that we knew were bad, just scratch an X, send a picture to us of the scratched one, so that we'd know that no, that one does not have any existing or does not have any remaining warranty. And then we sent them a brand new one that has a brand new warranty. Um, that's how we would do it. 
AMD has, you know, can serialize cards though. So maybe they could, you know, have people return the card at least, and then they wouldn't be out the entire cost of the card. I don't know. Would they, would they salvage memory chips? Probably not even. They're probably just, you know, I would like to know the answer to that. What does happen to a, a legit, like I'm not talking a customer return because I know where that's going to end up. That ends up in the open box pile, right? What happens to a legit dead GPU? Memory chip goes bad. Is someone remanufacturing that? I don't know. I, I'd be really, I'd be, I'd love to follow the journey of a, 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 a legitimately dead GPU. Does it just go into an e-waste pile? I don't know. Probably. But then some of them are extremely valuable. Like you've got GPUs where the memory chips on them alone are worth a couple hundred dollars, right? And the IT industry is notoriously stingy. I have, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, you could recycle it, but that still costs you $200, right? Unless someone's going to use those chips. But then if you use those chips, you can't sell it, you can't sell it as new. Unless you just do, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's under a cooler. Who's going to know? <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't think we have any LTX updates this week, Dan. You want to get me some merch messages? You ready? I'm finally ready. Yes, I've got Let's one here it. from Joe. What's I've up, been, Joe? I've been listening to this show in podcast form for six to eight years now. Just so you know, at least one of us does exist. You're a confused <laughs> man, Joe. You're a confused man. Six and eight years. Six and eight are two whole completely different numbers. <laughs> I also play competitive Mario Kart Wii. What's your favorite Mario Kart game? Mario Kart? Competitively. God damn it, Dan. <laughs> Mario Kart. It's a me, Mario. <laughs> still Mario. Better, still better Kart. than Chris Pratt. Um, <laughs> Mario Kart? Is that what I'm supposed yes. to say? Yeah. Like a uh, British person, like I'm supposed to talk like? British? Uh, Mario. It's Mario? All, it's far more. No, I mean, Mar R. Mario. Mario. I don't know. Mario. I can't do a British accent. Um, my favorite, man. The one I probably played the most was for the DS. I don't even remember what that one was called. I think it was the one legit game I actually owned for that console. Everything else was on my R4. No, no, I also bought Phantom Hourglass. Got suckered into that one. What a terrible game. Um, yeah, that's probably the one that I played the most. And it's the only one that I ever played online. Um, I don't know what the fuck that is. I, I, uh, for you, it's eight. Yeah, I know. I mean, they, they didn't ask you. <laughs> They knew you weren't going to answer. It's not like you can even talk. <laughs> um, the one I probably played second most was 64. So this, is just, this just comes down to like what consoles I owned and when I was at a time in my life when I like had any time to do anything. <coughs> yeah, I'd say that uh, I'd, I'd say my, my favorite was probably Mario Kart DS. Was that what it was called? I don't even remember. Yeah. All right, hit me. Look, if you can say Jif, I can say Mario. No, Jif is correct. Mario is dumb and bad. <laughs> we'll both, we both have stuff to work on. This one's from Reed. <laughs> yeah, um, I got some stuff to work on. <laughs> work on this guy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, when should purchasers of tickets of the cancelled LTX look out for the email, allowing them to rebuy the tickets they bought before the official sale of the tickets? Also, Luke, why don't casting seem to work on Floatplane, Android app, or Chrome? Uh, I take your silence as you're working on it. Uh, if you message support, <laughs> I'm sure they can help you out with that. Yeah, message float plane support, not LTT store support, not someone on the forum. Don't post on the forum. Message float plane support, and they can they can get you an answer for that. Um, as for the purchasers of tickets, I don't know. Um, I don't know if we have LTX support. We should at some point. We should figure that out. Uh, hey, Dan, can you yep. send a message to Colton and Chase to figure <laughs> out what the hell our plan for support for LTX is? Yeah, I've gotten some questions about security and things like that, okay. too. I think a lot of it is just still in the works. Okay, uh, yeah, but we Jake. should have somewhere that people can start submitting questions so that we can populate an FAQ with, you know, FAQ. Mm -hmm. Get it? FAQ? Yeah, anyway. The point is we can populate it with answers to those questions. Uh, All right. I'll get you another one if you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is from Cheese Floor. That's a very strange first name. I'll be using this driver to build my home lab. Is there any interesting that you? Is there anything interesting uh, that you're running on your home server 
besides Plex and Home Assistant that you haven't shared? Uh, P.S. Has Creator Warehouse ever thought of designing a vest? Um, we, I think, I think we have a vest that we worked on at some point. I don't know if it's ever going to come to light. Um, I'm not really a vest guy, to be perfectly honest with you. Like, I mean, we could do a fedora, <laughs> but we won't probably, unless we do. I mean, hmm. Now I kind of want to do like a rockin' fedora, <laughs> like a super awesome fedora. It's like with the finest materials. <laughs> Oh, huh. I'm going to okay. have a lot of velvet soon if you want to do a velvet Shoot. fedora. Now I want to do it. Um, uh, I don't know. We have like a Minecraft server, like a, just like a survival server that uh, we play family Minecraft on once in a while. I'm trying to think like what else I got on there. Not not too much, honestly. I mean, I use it as a NAS, obviously, but that, that's, a, that's about it. I'm not a super demanding user at home. That's the thing about like working all the time is you don't play much. Like, I have the coolest toys, and I hardly touch them. Like, uh, yeah, you, uh, you know Ivan, right? Uh, formerly, like, Ivan, who used to work here, was um, he was bugging me. He was like, hey, we should go, like, do the Sea of Sky Highway on the bikes. And I'm like, dude, I have literally not once in my life gone for a recreational ride. <laughs> like, nothing personal. I just probably won't do that. But, like, if you want to grab lunch or whatever, that's a different question. Like, I can probably I can probably make that work. But, like, I got this cool bike and I literally have only ever commuted on it. <laughs> like, okay. <sighs> okay, this one's from Michael. Linus slash Luke, what's your take on using blockchain technologies to help resolve monetization issues for creators? I think that it's unfortunate that blockchain, blockchain technology has such a, a, a negative vibe around it right now because there are legitimately really interesting things that could be done with it. The problem is just that it's completely unregulated and has become a space where grifters and scammers can exploit people and so that that harms the reputation that it has and I think harms its utility for legitimately useful purposes. Like I talked a, a little bit on a previous show about this company that had this goal of creating like a, a, a stock exchange essentially for creators to publicly list their companies using blockchain technology um, as, the, as the validation, the proof of ownership of shares. Um, <clears throat> so instead of buying some fucking ape or picture or whatever, like just some bullshit, you would actually be buying a share legally in Linus Media Group Incorporated that you could then go up in value with like, you know, the way that shares go up in value if Linus Media Group Incorporated, you know, outperforms its quarterly estimates or whatever the fuck, you know, financial shit happens. Um, and uh, we would also make money from the initial offering of shares and then from any secondary market movement of shares. And like the whole thing just like kind of actually makes sense. And blockchain would be a great way to do that. But yeah, this is a great point. Reverto in the Floatplane chat says kind of like Torrent. Yeah, like like Torrent technology, it's a super cool tech that is getting a really, really bad rep. Um, uh, a relative of mine, a member of my extended family, let's put it that way, is working for a company that is using blockchain technology to um, to help with aerial mapping, which is super cool. So essentially what you do is you submit mapping units like you, you record and submit map uh, and you get these tokens. And then when people need aerial maps of that place, they, they compensate your tokens, right? Or, or they, they have to buy tokens that make your tokens go up in value or whatever. Basically, there's like this, this mapping economy. So drone operators in their spare time can just fly around mapping shit and get compensated Anytime anyone utilizes the mapping, that's so cool, right? But as soon as you say blockchain, people are like, oh, uh, blockchain, that. right? No, oh, crypto. No, the tokens make sense in this case, Jelly D. Um, why not? Because in this case, there is a clear reason for people to exchange real fiat currency for the tokens, right? It's, it's actually a good thing. Super cool. Um, all right. What else we got? Okay. Uh, I've got another here from uh, Jose. 
Hey, Linus and Luke, what are some challenges you've faced when redesigning the screwdriver to the short oh. version or the backpack to the slimmer version? Oh, hold on a second. Uh -oh. uh, Algorithm in the Twitch chat asks, why do you need a marketplace for maps when they can be shared freely on the internet at barely any cost? Because the drone operator's time is not fucking free. <laughs> why should it be barely any cost? Why don't they get compensated? Besides, we're not talking satellite imagery that is freely available on Google Maps. We're talking like 3D, like topographical maps, right? Like we're talking high resolution maps. We're like moving into the future. We're talking about, you know, you could invest in a drone that is capable of creating like super, super accurate maps. And anyone who needs the resolution, be it for, um, you know, I don't know, resource exploration or, or whatever it is would have a, a very strong financial incentive to pay for it. This isn't just for, like, randoms to be like, oh, it'd be kind of cool to, like, see a map of, like, this, like, forest bit here. <laughs> that's, that's, not what, that's not what it's for. Uh, and anything that has a commercial purpose, right, you should be paid for. <laughs> like, we, we have a very clear policy here. If we are going to make money on something, uh, we insist that we pay for your work period like that's just that's just the way it is there are things that we don't make money on and we'll never make money on and we're very very grateful to people for their for their 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 very very generous contributions i mean someone like a colonel mortis for example would really stand out to me as someone who's just been been an amazing member of our community over the years um and i you know what i think there's another exception uh we take volunteers at ltx I'll be honest with you guys, though, if if you had everyone does it and the model is not feasible, it's just literally not feasible if you don't take volunteers to help you run a large scale event like that. Um, we like we looked at the numbers. It's wild. Um, and they are still compensated. So they get I think the way that it works. Yeah, if you guys want to volunteer, I think the signups are live on ltxexpo.com. Uh, the way it works is I think you get two days of admission and you volunteer one of the days is is how it typically works and then there's also like some like some um like some swag pack type stuff and stuff like that and i got a message back from chase about ltx oh yeah um yeah, they're trying to set something up next week hopefully cool okay okay um this one's for Eric, uh, from Eric, sorry. Oh, uh, is this the one you read before? No, I think this is a, a different person. Did, did you read one? Oh, I might have read this one before. Yeah, the LTTstore.com. Okay, I, uh, the things that will be at LTTstore.com at LTX will mostly just be like what you would find on LTTstore.com. Uh, yes, we plan to have screwdrivers and or backpacks there. Um, glad you picked up a water bottle. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have more stuff there. It's not going to be like the LTTstore.com concept that I shared before where we're going to have like stuff that was tested by the lab, you know, like discounted electronics or whatever. I still want to do that, but that would definitely not be at LTX. Okay, this one's from Michael. How many t-shirts do I need to buy to get Linus Muniz to say snoochie booches? <laughs> what? <laughs> I think that's from one of the later <laughs> Silent Bob. <laughs> And yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, I I have not watched every. I, I talked about this in the pre-stream. I have I haven't watched like every Jay and Silent Bob uh, adjacent piece of content. Um, sure, S snoochy booches. I guess. There you go. I don't go. know what it means. It cost one T-shirt. Uh -oh. uh, is it really bad? I have no idea. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. This is the. Uh, you don't have to address it next week. Uh, this is from Charles. I'm going to blow one of my few times that I'm going to talk. Uh, is it going to be a, an intellectual monologue? Unfortunately, this time, not really. It's Snoochie Boochies, the person typoed. No. No. Snoochie Boochies. No. And that's it. My jaw hurts. Cool. I appreciate your sacrifice, Luke. Uh, this one's from Charles. Linus, recently newlywed in my early 30s. Wife only into mobile legends for gaming as of now. Was Yvonne into gaming when you first were together and any tips slash games to introduce my wife? Um, she wasn't really. Like, she played casual games. Uh, one that she apparently played a lot was called Dangerous Dave. Um, yeah, I'm glad she doesn't play Dangerous Dave anymore. <laughs> know what I mean? Uh, Dave, he's dangerous. A lot of STDs and shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Um, <laughs> I would say the best way to to get her into gaming, Yvonne um, really enjoys playing co-op games. Uh, games like Trine, uh, Overcooked, if you don't like your marriage. Um, she played a lot of like Left 4 Dead and Team Fortress 2 with us back in the day. Uh, it takes a, you'll definitely have to uh, you'll you'll want to find things that are pretty forgiving for newcomers. And I would strongly recommend you know if you can um, involve involve her in like the squad. You know, like instead of having a four man group, grab two squad members and like carry her. And like, make it make it fun. Be supportive. Um, just make it fun. That's the most important thing. I think that's what a lot of people miss. Is it doesn't matter what game you play. Uh, it matters that you make it fun and make it a, a, a an experience that she'll look back on and be like, "Yeah, I want to try that again." Okay, got one here from Tim. Uh, this one's a little more interesting. Uh, L and L at all love the show and channel. Curious to hear your opinions and opinions on private companies being treated as infrastructure, e.g., Google, YouTube, Facebook, and should they be government regulated? Also, what would happen if one of them just shut down overnight? <clears throat> Cheers. Yeah, we're in a dangerous place. I mean, that uh... <sighs> this is a problem that's been developing for a long time. I mean, I. I remember, man, back in the day, I forget, I, I forget who it was, but I, I watched a really cool video about the the way that um, U.S. telcos essentially took government money, took public money to build out a ton of infrastructure, just completely fucking didn't do it, and then just kept jacking up rates anyway uh, for customers. Like it's. Uh, <laughs> You know, at that point, you go, well, hold on a second. You took public funding. Are you a private company? What does that even mean? And, and I'm, to be clear, I'm, I don't think by private companies you meant companies that are not publicly traded. I think you meant not government-run entities, so any private or public company. Um, and so so this, this problem, this, this train has been heading towards us for a long time. Yeah, if, if Google suddenly disappeared overnight it would be disastrous. I, I think I think it's fair I think it's fair to use the D word. Yeah, it'd be disastrous. Um what would the recourse be? I, I, I have no idea. Could you know, does can you can you tell them you know, send government agents to, you know, point a gun at them and tell them to turn the server back on? Like it f the fuck do you do, right? Yeah, I don't know. Silent Loop doesn't know either. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I just don't have the answer to that one. Certainly a complicated one. Um, oh, no. Am I allowed to swear on this stream? No. Okay. I didn't think so. Um, why don't you read this one out, then? Um, if you two are Jay and Silent Bob, who at Linus Media Group are Dante and Randall? What do you think, Luke? Who would be our Randall? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think either. I don't think we are Jay and Bob anyway. So I, cool question. Love it. <laughs> Useful thought experiment. But I, I just don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm over two. I'm over two. Oh, for two. Oh, this Dan one? can swear if he wants. I don't, I don't give a shit. Uh, that's fine. Um, got one here from Patrick. Hi there. You mentioned that you had put in place a policy preventing personal items, SD cards and such, to be used at work. What problems caused this to... It's gone. Uh, what problems caused this uh, to exist? How many items were lost? Oh, it wasn't that items were lost. It was that just, that's just stupid. Why are you bringing your own stupid fucking lens to work when you can just put in a procurement request and we'll buy a lens and you can keep your lens at home where it belongs and where it's not going to get damaged? Why are you putting wear and tear on your personal devices? <laughs> I don't understand. There were times when we did need people to help out with their personal devices, admittedly. Uh, we did not have a lot of money early on. Um, and there have been times when procurement has been slow. We didn't always have a procurement department. But at this point, if you can't get something procured, then you need to like 
figure it out. Talk to someone in operations or procurement. <laughs> get, 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 get it, get it. Let's get her done. Um, because clearly, if you're having a problem, then someone else is probably also having a problem, and that's something that we need to solve. Uh, yeah, I just, I just didn't want to be responsible for someone's like expensive personal item getting lost or stolen, right? Like that sucks. Hopefully, I, uh, my orders will be in soon. Uh, this one is from Brayden. Hey guys, I've never been able to catch the show live, but I'm at least able to send a merch message today. I'm curious what you guys think about the leak of the Steam Deck 2. How did you want Valve to change slash progress with handhelds? Have a great week. I did I also not didn't see hear it. about this. Uh... I don't know. AMD, Little Phoenix, uh, th there seems to be not a lot of um, backing for this, so I'm not going to, I don't think I'm really going to weigh in on this one. Uh, but how do I want Valve to change slash progress? I mean, I mean, Steam Deck is honestly really great. Uh, more, more, more of that and more, more better. I'd love to see a little bit more battery life. I'd love to see it be quieter, personally. Um, higher resolution display. Honestly, I'd rather have an OLED than... A higher resolution LCD at this point, if it's a if it's a cost question, or if there, if there's a trade off there, I think that's about it for me. Okay, and the last one I have curated is uh, from anonymous. When does Luke would want to retire? Well, Luke would love to answer that question for you, but uh, his jaw's a little sore. Uh, if you know what <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I gotta play the character, okay? Um, I don't think Luke wants to retire. I think Luke plans to work until he drops dead. Um, I don't think he'd have it any other way. <clears throat> um, there's a few more. Uh, Joshua C. asks, uh, Luke, feel better. Been revamping my resume site to apply. Does over-engineering carry much weight in consideration? I would say probably not too much. Um... It's going to come more down to, you know, the interview and any kind of skill testing process that Luke has in place with his team. I'm going to go ahead and archive that. Uh, Steven says, if you guys had a button that you press... Wait, what if you guys had a button you had to press at the same time on your Steam decks to start and stop the show? Kind of like those silly launch sequences. Oh, you mean stream decks. Haha, -ha, confusing. Um, like those silly launch sequences. That would be fun and completely not worth me paying anyone to code. I forbid anyone from the development team who is watching this to work on a feature like that. That is not valuable. Um, <laughs> Elias asks, uh, what is your laptop and external GPU enclosure for when you travel uh, and still have enough performance to play demanding titles? What is your laptop and external for when you... Oh, what, what do you use? Uh, oh, I'm still using the... Um, Ah, oh, the Flow X13. Yeah, that thing that thing is sick with the external like PCIe by eight, uh, like uh, eGPU thing. That's pretty sick. Um, I don't have to use that anymore now that Framework properly supports Thunderbolt on their latest laptop, and I have upgraded mine to the to the latest platform. But I just like already have all my games on that one and stuff, so I just throw it in my bag. I don't travel much anymore though, so it doesn't really come up too much. AJO says, I think YouTube often gives a false impression. Um, Linus Media Group is, of course, a business. I'm not asking for names, but how many people at LMG would you consider a friend? Like hanging out with after work or something? Ah, uh, man, it's tough. I mean, there's too many people here that I could realistically say, I'm friends with everyone. And I'd say that there's almost certainly going to be... Um, a skew towards people who have been here longer just because I have a lot more familiarity with them. And we know familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, um, closeness. Um, <laughs> I don't hang out with almost anyone after work, like just at all. So it's tough. Also, the lines can be a little bit blurry sometimes. Like I'll, like I'll see people that Yvonne hangs out with after work sometimes, but that doesn't mean that like, I would have invited them over. Like, in some cases, that would have been super weird. Like, if I invited, you know... Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give, like, too much... I don't want to give any personal detail about anyone. But, like, okay, we have a female colleague that comes over on Friday nights sometimes. I wouldn't invite them. 
that's I just wouldn't, you know, to my house on a Friday night. I just wouldn't. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not worth it, even if nothing happened. It's just, I don't want them to have been there and me being there. It's just it's not worth it. You know, people talk, right? Um, Yvonne can. And I'll be like, hi. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Enjoy craft night. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, these, the reasons I have to read them is because they haven't actually been like sorted yet. So I'm just kind of YOLOing it. Uh, Renee asks, what's the most in t important tech upgrade in your house over a normal house? Ethernet. Ethernet and conduit everywhere. Man, I love conduit. Just like run cables to places where that didn't have before cables. Ah, love it. And just having ethernet everywhere is kind of like, it's kind of like having emergency conduit because you can convert ethernet to damn near anything hdmi freaking whatever i don't know man it's it's ethernet's awesome i love it i'll use my second time of saying something conduit is one of the extremely few points in life where you can actually future proof something yes conduit's cool raw h asks what would you say your videos are rated i love watching with my son but sometimes your sexual jokes are definitely not for kids can you please put a rating prior to starting the video? I can tell you right now, there's probably not going to be a rating at the beginning of every video. That would be pretty jarring. Um, I think it would open us up to widespread mockery. But um, if I had to give a rating, I'd say we're probably PG-13 for the most part. Today's WAN show is a bit of an exception. There was a fairly egregious amount of swearing. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure this is going to end up I've, with limited monetization. I think I've kind of... I think I've targeted and I'm probably going to land there. Um, but yeah, PG-13 is sort of what we go for. Our parental guidance is advised. Glad you like it, Chris L. All right, that's it for the show. We will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Bye. He tried, guys. He tried. That's as much as I can do. Dan's working on it. Oh, it broke the thing. Thanks, Chris L. I am sweating so very much. Hey, I'm wearing plastic. There is zero breathability. I'm, I know you're suffering. But I am a sweaty boy from the tip of my head to the balls of my toes. <laughs>